Um, this is going to really be the first uh, inaugural session uh, for listening that we're doing this week um, and our second annual round of customer listening sessions with the goal of really making sure that we uh, as a department um, take some time uh, regularly to stop and listen to our customers. So I'd like to start by quickly introducing um, staff from the Human Services Department who are on and who are going to help with today's session. Um, we've got uh, Ryan O'Connor, who is a project manager who's going to be helping uh, manage the slides today um, as sort of our technical lead. We've got Ashley Espinosa from our communications office, who's going to be um, also interesting with today's presentation. Um, we have Martha Payne and Dr. Neil Bowen from the Behavioral Health Services Division. Uh, uh, Martha will be uh, presenting um, a set of questions related to your behavioral health experience that we're hoping to get feedback on from all of you. We have Shanita Harrison from our um, Information Technology Division uh, and our main customer liaison in the department. She's going to be um, helping with our polls today uh, so that we can get some feedback. And then we have Melody Kohler and Nicole Como as well from our Medicaid division. Um, so Melody will be helping to facilitate today. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. Um, so today what we're going to do is spend most of the time hopefully hearing from uh, customers and uh, those who represent our customers or who have the most awareness of their experience. Um, really, uh, we're going to spend as little time as possible talking and really the most most of the time listening. So that's really the primary goal of today's uh, session and the primary thing on our agenda. We're going to spend a couple of minutes just talking about some of the changes to the Human Services Department's delivery model um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly around how our field offices are run and um, how our behavioral health um, and Medicaid programs have adapted to the emergency um, and implemented some new services for our customers. And then we'll spend most of the time, as I mentioned, um, asking questions and hoping for feedback from our audience members today. Next slide, please. So we want to start out with just an overview of uh, the Human Services Department's mission and goals. Um, our mission at the Human Services Department is to transform lives. Working with our partners, we design and deliver innovative, high quality health and human services that improve the security and promote independence for New Mexicans in their communities. We have four main goals, and within each of these goals, we have a number of strategic tactics that we are trying to accomplish. Um, and the feedback that you all give us today will be um, sorted out and really thought about in the context of these goals uh, and whether we need to add new um, tactics or items uh, for ourselves as a department um, from the based on the feedback we received today. So our first goal is really to help New Mexicans. We want to make sure that we improve the value and range of services we provide to ensure that every qualified New Mexican receives timely and accurate benefits. HSD provides medical assistance, we provide uh, food assistance, we provide energy assistance and cash assistance and child support services. Today we're focused primarily on Medicaid and behavioral health, um, but we want to make sure that New Mexicans have the broad range of services and are, are able to receive um, all of the services we provide if they're eligible for those. We want to make sure that we communicate effectively. So our goal, a second goal is to create effective, transparent communication to enhance the public trust. Um, that includes listening. Uh, we want to make sure that we are doing as much listening as we can uh, from our customers and other entities who really are stakeholders um, for the department. Our third goal is to make access easier. Uh, we want to successfully implement technology to give customers and staff the best and most convenient access to services and information as possible. Using uh, IT, we will talk a little bit about what we've done in that area and uh, ask for your thoughts about how we can do better. And then our fourth goal is really an internal goal related to HSD employees, uh, and that is to support each other. Um, in the department, we wanna promote an environment of mutual respect, trust, and open communication to grow and reach our professional goals. 
Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, today we're really seeking feedback from you all about how well HSD is meeting its mission and goals. We want to hear from our customers uh, about what we can do to improve our business processes at HSD and deliver better service. Uh, we want to learn what we can do to make it easier for our customers to access the services we offer and get feedback from you about how we can improve. And we want to find out the best ways to communicate with all of you. Next slide, please. Um, just a couple of things I want to review as we sort of open things up for feedback. Um, we are recording this session. We will be posting it uh, later uh, online so that other uh, stakeholders and customers can review the session or see, um, see the feedback that we got. Um, in order to keep the session manageable, everyone's going to be muted until the time uh, which we're asking for questions. Um, if you have a comment in the meantime, please feel free to submit that in the chat box during the presentation. Um, we will be opening up the presentation to hear feedback and then we will unmute you to offer input. Um, but uh, while we're doing the presentation component, which is short, I promise, uh, we will just be keeping people on mute. Um, once we open things up for feedback, if you'd like to speak, just ask in the chat. Uh, so there's a little uh, icon at the top that looks like a uh, thought bubble uh, or a speech bubble. Uh, you'll put uh, your question in chat and then we will call on you and unmute you and you can speak. Um, you know, depending on time, we, we're asking for comments uh, to be no more than one minute. Uh, we may have a little bit more time just depending on uh, feedback. So we do want to have a chance to hear from folks today and uh, we may have to limit uh, comments to no more than one minute if we start to run out of time. Um, today we really are, I just want to make sure that you know that questions or feedback about specific issues may require some additional follow-up from HSD staff before we can answer. So certain questions may require um, specific examples for us to research. Um, and that we'll take those back and do internal research. Uh, we'd like to capture your question and your contact information if you're okay with that so we can follow up with you after the meeting is over if, you're, um, if you have a specific concern or issue that we need to help you resolve. Um, and then finally, we just wanna encourage and maintain a respectful environment for everyone today's, uh, in today's discussion. Um, any comments that are disruptive could result in someone's removal from the meeting. So um, those are our ground rules for this afternoon. Next slide. <clears throat> you are going to hear these questions. I'm going to skip over this. This is just the list of questions that we have for all of you, but we're going to get into the heart of it uh, here in a few minutes. So we'll keep going uh, and we'll come back to these questions in a little bit. Next slide. <clears throat> So we wanted to just spend a couple of minutes talking about changes uh, that HSD has made to the customer service delivery model during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're really looking for feedback from our customers to determine um, which of these uh, changes we need to keep uh, and what is working well. Um, so next slide, please. <clears throat> our customers will, uh, those who have, uh, had to interact with the field office may have noticed that we've had uh, some drastic changes to our field office operations to make sure that we could keep uh, both our staff and customers safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have implemented curbside service at all of our field offices um, with limited lobby hours to reduce in-person contact. Um, at the same time, we more than doubled our call center staff and actually launched a new call center during the pandemic um, to take what was a, a pretty substantial call volume increase. We've increased our food delivery sites and increased online applications for all HSD programs, um, as well as implementing and focusing on real-time eligibility for Medicaid. Next slide, please. Um, the Behavioral Health uh, Services Division has done a lot of really creative things to make sure that we can keep delivering services uh, to people who need them, uh, while at the same time maintaining COVID safety practices, um, with a big focus on telephonic visits and telehealth services, uh, which we'll be asking for more feedback about during this presentation. We want to hear how well that is going for all of you. Um, 
There have also been a new focus on using certified peer support workers for people who were in, in isolation shelters uh, during the COVID pandemic to make sure that we could support them and meet their behavioral health needs. Um, and behavioral health has also implemented harm reduction for patients with alcohol use disorder and implemented a public service announcement campaign for substance use disorder, um, as well as launching a new app for the New Mexico Crisis and Access Line, NMCAL. Next slide, please. Um, and on the Medicaid side, again, also a bunch of creative approaches to make sure that we can continue to deliver services and care um, while at the same time maintaining uh, COVID safe practices. So a much expanded use of telehealth and telephonic visits, um, a simplified and extended eligibility process to facilitate enrollment and retention, and in fact, really have uh, retained uh, almost everyone on their Medicaid eligibility during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've implemented a lot of flexibilities for our healthcare providers, um, streamlined processes uh, to enroll our providers so that they could serve Medicaid patients, including Medicaid providers from other states, and then implemented emergency rate increases to pay certain types of providers uh, to account for their changes in business practices and safety during the pandemic. Um, and we also expanded access to COVID-19 testing for uninsured patients. Next slide. So with that, I am going to ask Shanita Harrison to uh, pop on the screen here and help us with our first audience poll, which will kick us off into uh, the next the round of uh, getting feedback from our customers um, today. Thanks, Shanita. Ryan, can you give me control? I don't know if I can share. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, we're going to do a quick poll just to see how Medicaid is meeting your healthcare needs. So if you can go to menti.com and use the code that you see there on the screen, this is a um, live action poll that'll allow us to see the results um, as you type them in. There's also a chat there on the bottom. Uh, when you enter in the code, um, you can tell us if it's not meeting your needs, what we can do to better serve you. So I'll just give everybody a few minutes if you can Go to menti.com, um, put in the code 47699369. Um, the poll will show up there and it will be able to tell, um, you'll be able to take the poll and give us some feedback. So just give you some a few minutes to get that done.
Okay, I think we've given some time here, so um, we can all stop sharing. If I can. Thanks, Shanita. Um, so did you wanna, so I'll just go over what the results were that we saw um, just from the quick poll that we did. So we got seven, it looked like seven yeses uh, to the question about whether Medicaid is meeting your healthcare needs, two no's and three not sure's. Um, so uh, this is really helpful and this is gonna really kick us off today. We'd love to hear uh, from those of you who really in particular feel like you're either not sure it's meeting your healthcare needs or that it's not meeting your healthcare needs that we can learn more about what we could do better um, and what services we need to be providing. Uh, but also happy to hear from those of you who say that it is meeting your healthcare needs and what we're doing well. So with that, um, Melody, should, can I kick it over to you and you uh, take us through the Medicaid questions? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, what was the most difficult part of applying for Medicaid? Are we asking people, Carrie, to put the answers in chat or are people able to unmute and speak? Yeah, if the if someone would like to give us feedback about, uh, I wonder if we should first sort of uh, hear from folks who answered the first poll question, and if anyone has any feedback related to that question, <laughs> um, and then we can kind of get in here. I'm just wondering if that would be the best way to do it. So, um, for anyone who may have said that Medicaid is not meeting your healthcare needs, um, or you're not sure. Um, if you would be willing to let us know what we could be doing better, that would be fantastic. We'd love to hear from you now. Um, and Ryan, are we having people put, use the chat uh, to let us know if they'd like to give feedback? Yeah, please use the chat feature and you can either answer right there and we'll read it off or we can unmute you if you'd like to speak. Okay, so folks may be a little nervous about responding and that's okay. We understand uh, this is sort of an unusual format. Um, please don't hesitate to let us know, um, but we can keep going as well. So um, the, we'd love to know uh, for those of you who have uh, applied for Medicaid, what is the most challenging part of that process? Um, and if anyone has feedback related to that question um, that you would be willing to offer. Okay, we have a response in the chat. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, people who are unhoused often have a difficult time accessing the online portal to apply because they don't have a phone or internet. Yeah, that's really helpful feedback. M Melissa, do you wanna to add to any of it, to that or speak uh, on behalf of that? Is there something that we could do to make things easier? We've we've talked at HSD about going out to you know areas of housing insecurity, um, homeless shelters, and things like that to go out and do actual enrollment events. Would that be something that would help? That would probably be um, very helpful. Um, also, if there was maybe um, like I know MBD started up some kiosks at some Albertsons. Um, through COVID where people could be able to deal with the MBD business without having to go in there. Um, maybe if there were some kiosks around where folks could at a time that works for them go apply. Um, the process itself I don't think is difficult, it's getting there. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that's really helpful, especially uh, during this time when we've uh, really focused on online application. So that's that's good feedback. Right, and you know, I think those of us that live in sort of the Santa Fe Albuquerque core area of New Mexico forget how hard online access can be for people outside of that area. Great, thank you. We have another comment. It would be helpful to apply at physician's offices and emergency rooms. I do believe most hospitals, um, if not all hospitals, have people that can help folks apply for Medicaid. Um, they're not there 24 seven. So, you know, a lot of times when you go to an ER, it's in the middle of the night. I believe they, they do have those services. Um, but yes, kiosks in other locations would certainly be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or a kiosk. this is another good comment, a kiosk in the ER. So rather than needing to go during, you know, eight to five hours when there's a person there to help you, just having a, a kiosk with with Internet access would definitely be a, a helpful. Great suggestion. We have another comment, uh, language barriers in assistance with filling out applications and more clear guidance on the income eligibility. Um, Kenya, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Do you uh, want to add to sort of the language barriers? Is that really around any particular population or just a sense that um, really we need more uh, language assistance for folks uh, to fill out those applications in all? Um, yeah, I, I work with a lot of parents and a lot of them don't speak English so they can't um, fill out the form and I'm sure there is Spanish forms but then they have questions and paperwork and um, just you know just the amount of questions that they have are endless and not in not in every office there's somebody who's available to answer that um, and then on the guy on the income guidelines I think it's a little bit confusing on how it it's broken down. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Yes, thank you. We have another comment from Delfina. Uh, physical health, yes. Mental health, not so much because the lack of providers makes wait lists months long. Children's and families can't wait. Bringing up services on the waiver, respite and family peer support is weak. Meetings with little action, family peer support too restrictive and who can provide it? There seems to be little to no urgency in bringing up services for children and their families. Safety net services and prevention not given the time they need, especially for how important they are. Thank you, Delphina. Yeah, thank you. So we're hearing, I think this comment is really related to a lack of access uh, in terms of meeting the healthcare needs on the uh, mental health side in particular. Did you wanna say anything else about that? Okay. Does anyone else have anything to add related to the diff most difficult parts of applying for Medicaid? Um, this is some great feedback to start us out, so thank you. Um, and if we don't have any additional comments on this question, Melody, uh, please take us to the next one, thanks. Thank you, next slide. Is Medicaid meeting your healthcare needs? Are there services you need that you can't get from Medicaid? And I think that last response was in regards to this question in the polling, um, but more specifically, uh, the services we've already heard about, the behavioral health services. Are there other services that anyone wants to talk about that they've had difficulty getting?
You know, there were also a couple of comments um, in our initial poll that uh, people weren't sure if Medicaid is meeting their healthcare needs. And um, if anyone would like to elaborate there, that would be that would be great. Looks like we're getting some comments in. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Teresa, who is a, a presumptive eligibility determiner, but feels Medicaid should have some dental and vision benefits for people who qualify. And then um, another comment from Christina, extending vision and dental for adults. So we do have dental and vision, but only for children, I believe. Is that correct? There's some uh, dental coverage does extend for um, everyone who has full Medicaid, um, including adults. The vision benefit is narrow, though it does not cover all adults. But there are some people on partial coverage categories that don't have dental services. So really helpful feedback. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and I have heard some comments from people that about um, lack of providers in the dental area as well where they do have coverage but it's hard to get get in appointments with dental providers in certain areas um, next comment from mindy neurology and specialist care in rural areas of new mexico those with the need have great difficulty traveling for hours as is often necessary and the same for behavioral health services and we have another comment from Bradley for behavioral health. It's not just access, but confidential access. In smaller towns, access may be available, but if you go to the BX provider, everyone in town knows you're getting counseling. Maybe some places uh, like the public library with private computer rooms to access online services would be helpful. Maybe something like this already exists and I don't know about it. I think that's one of the things that uh, people really love about having the telemedicine access with behavioral health is they feel more comfortable to um, be able to talk with someone without necessarily being seen in an office or um, having to make that appointment and physically go in. And that's something, Bradley, that's been expanded greatly during COVID, um, the access to do services, not with just with behavioral health, but with everything, um, through the telephone or through meetings such as this where you can see each other face to face but don't have to physically be present. We have another comment when choosing an MCO they are not explained as to what they offer or what the differences are. And yeah, um, that's a really uh, accurate comment, I think, because it's uh, really primarily just on the um, application form that you would select. What would be helpful uh, as, you know, people you're helping facilitate eligibility for or uh, for yourself um, to know about the MCOs? Um, well, just from working, like I said, with previous um, individuals, I know they provide different services or they offer different things, um, and but they change so often as well that, uh, you know, my clients ask me, well, what, like, I don't, which one is which or which one should I choose? And, um, you know, the benefits are different. And especially the, the baby benefits, the prenatal benefits, because that's the majority of my clients. Um, and that's not explained to them either. Um, this this Medicaid is going to, you know, provide you with the breast pump or a car seat, whatever the case may be. That's not explained either. Um, so I think when choosing an MCO, they don't, they don't think about that. They're just like, well... Whichever one is offered to me, a lot of times they don't even choose because they don't know the differences. Um, and I can educate them a little bit, but like I said, it changes often that I don't keep up with um, with what is being offered a lot. Um, and I think having that explained more, it, once they do their... Um, their appointment, their interview, I'm not sure what, what the correct wording for that is. Um, but maybe once they do that initial contact, maybe explaining that to them, I don't know. 
I don't know how That's else helpful. This, yeah. this could go about. Great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We have another comment from Melissa. If people understood who provides what services in their area, they could make a more informed decision. And so that's that's part of it besides which uh, what the coverage options are between the various MCOs is uh, what providers are um, enrolled with those MCOs is, is often an important thing to know when choosing. Great, great feedback. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if uh, there's no additional comments. Do you want to go on to the next question, Melody? Yes, thank you. Did you face barriers when trying to find a doctor or schedule an appointment? I'm not seeing any any comments in the chat on this one. I think in New Mexico we have so many rural areas where where people face barriers, even regardless of what their insurance is. But um, I think what we're getting at with the question is, have have you had issues finding a provider that takes Medicaid that is able to to get you in for services in a, a reasonable amount of time? I have something on that. Um... Uh, in my area, again, for the prenatal, it is very difficult um, to get in. They usually don't get them in until months, months out. So that's basically almost going into their second trimester by the time they're first seen. Um, again, I mean, I don't know if it's much of a Medicaid issue. Is this more of a provider issue? Thank you very much for that. I think there's another comment related to psychiatry um, and the long wait times to get those services as well. Yes. Um, and then there's another comment from Teresa. I let my consumers know what is accepted where, and I do tell them the differences between the MCOs, especially if they are pregnant or have children. We have another comment. Um, this person is, is not aware of any issues. Um, I think that there are provider shortages nationwide in, in many specialties that are not unique to Medicaid, um, which is, is definitely challenging. It can be uh, even more um, frustrating when it's something where you need help right away, like behavioral health or, or someone's newly pregnant or. Thanks. So I think, um, yeah, my takeaway here is that we, you know, may want to take some take a harder look at what we're doing there in the mental health arena, which I know our behavioral health uh, leaders are you know really working on and then also i think the prenatal appointments um it's very interesting feedback that yes. will help us as we sort of think about what we need to do to make things better thank you carrie are we ready to move on to the next slide yeah i think so thanks Sorry about that. Give me one second here. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Okay, what improvements would you like to see from Medicaid or from your managed care organization, your MCO?
One of the things that we recognize is that most Medicaid members are enrolled with an MCO. And so if there are concerns about, um, you know, one of the, you know, either Presbyterian Blue Cross or Western Sky, those are Medicaid managed care organizations. But if there are concerns or if things that you all think they could do better, um, we would love to hear that. It's Kenya again. Um, <laughs> on this, do you guys have a system um, or something in place to where you know you you begin seeing um, somebody who's starting their their prenatal appointments? Does somebody reach out to that client to let them know what is available to them? Like the incentives. So you're saying like when you have a new, um, the MCO has a new member or a member that they find out is pregnant, does someone reach out to kind of cover the behavior, what the prenatal benefit package looks like and the incentives, right. the different sort of added services? Right. I'm not sure how that process is handled. Um, Melody, do you know? I'm not sure if we, we may have some MCOs on the call as well, but we can take that back. I mean, I think, uh, even if we don't know the answer, it's a it's a good piece of feedback for us to incorporate. Yeah. I'm not sure of the answer either, Carrie, but it is a great question. So they each MCO offers different value added services. Some may give a I don't know a car seat or something uh, to a yeah yeah, and they do. Yeah. Um, but my a lot of the clients that I work with, they don't know about it. Um, right. And I'm like, hey, have you called? Have you? Um, you know, especially the breast pump, we're really big on um, on breastfeeding. But you know, just out of conversation, I'll ask them about that, and nobody really ever knows what I'm talking about. Um, so they're not being reached out to, to letting them know. You know, this is available if you need it. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone on the call from any of the MCOs that might know the answer? It looks like Blue Cross is on. <laughs> Christina, we don't want to put you on the, on the spot. Right. She, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> no, um, I did want to mention, I do work for Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Mexico, and I am uh, certified to take Medicaid enrollment. And um, yes, we do reach out to the members, um, particularly um, well, in relation to the prenatal members that you mentioned, we do have a special beginnings team that um, regularly reaches out to our members to ensure they're aware of what's available to them. Um, and of course, a member packet does go to the member once they get enrolled with that MCO, at least on our end. And um, so, yeah, I think, um, gosh, um, they do a lot of outreach to our members. And um, obviously right now um, with, the, with COVID, um, you know, myself, I do outreach. We haven't been out in the field um, because we would inform members at health fairs or events as well. Um, but, uh, and in addition, they can get assigned a care coordinator that would also inform them of that information. So, yes, yeah, so it is something that does happen. So, I'd be happy to provide information from Blue Cross Blue Shield um, if you need anything further. Thank you very much, Christina. You're welcome. Is that just the, the packet that's sent when they first enroll with Blue Cross, or is it something that goes out if they have a change in status, such as pregnancy? Um, no, actually, I was referring to the packet that goes out when they initially become members, but um, we okay. do continually send mailings out. And, um, of course, we hold our member advisory board meetings, so we also include that information during those meetings. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got a few more comments in the chat here. Um, Medicaid and Behavioral Health Services Division have family and youth peers at the table when planning system improvements, um, a sense of urgency in helping people get the services they need, making it easier to find out where a member might be on the registry waiver programs, uh, it would be great to have a universal database to access Medicaid claims across the MCOs. That is a 
good point and something I believe we're working on. Uh, and then so some comments from Christine with Blue Cross, which she just uh, spoke. Uh, we have a comment, MCO care coordinators do reach out to the members that become pregnant so long as they are enrolled in care coordination. Thank you, that's helpful. And then the last comment, our organization families ASAP is at the table with some MCOs. Blue Cross does prioritize working with us to provide family peer support for their members. We are invited to the advisory group for Prez and Magellan and we contract with Medicaid to conduct conduct their mental health Medicaid satisfaction surveys, which includes the MCOs. Thank you all for your comments. If there's nothing else, we can go to the next slide, Ryan. Okay, if you received care coordination, how has your care coordinator helped you and what could they do to be more helpful? So just so everyone knows, care coordination is available uh, through the MCOs for members that meet certain uh, levels of care. So members that have certain health conditions, then they're enrolled with a, a care coordinator which provides additional assistance to them. So there may not be a lot of feedback related to this question, um, and that's okay. Oh, look, there's one from Mindy. Yes, thank you, Mindy. Uh, she says, working portals for members to directly message their care coordinators would be great. Members often avoid lengthy calls, but would love the ability to access succinct communication. That's great feedback. Yes, it is. We may have made this question too specific and we may not have people that are in care coordination on this call. <laughs> Shall we move to the next question? Sure. Thank you, Ryan. Have you been able to get the behavioral health services you needed this past year? And we had another comment on care coordination. We may have moved forward too quickly. If care coordinators were specific to the area the client was looking for services in, they would be more useful. So that is that is good feedback as well. Um, and then we have another one from Teresa. I believe PHP is the only portal where you can do this, unsure of Western Sky or Blue Cross. And that would be in regards to the previous question about uh, easier communications with the care coordinators. Thanks, Melody. Um, and I think you can, uh, I think Martha Payne is going to facilitate the behavioral health uh, questions. So feel free to hand off to her um, to kick that off. Thank you, Melody. Have we had any responses? Does anyone want to make a comment about being able to access behavioral health services?
We have a couple of comments about the difficulty in finding behavioral health services for children. Um, due to COVID in the rural areas, accessing behavioral health services has been tough. Would anyone like to make any more comments about that? Presbyterian has specialized care coordinators. This is an answer to the previous question about care coordination. Uh, specialized care, behavioral health with, within behavioral health services, applied behavioral analysis, juvenile justice, substance abuse, traumatic brain injury, and complex issues in children's services. Thank you for those comments. Unfortunately, this is Delfina. Unfortunately, behavioral respite and family peer support is sorely lacking. Traumatic brain injury services are also needed. Rural services have very little to provide in a timely manner. Reactive attachment services need a major boost. I'm wondering if those of you who reside in the more rural areas have found access a little more easily available during the COVID with telehealth services? It looks like there's another comment related to um, behavioral health access, Martha, from Mindy. Mindy, let's see. Behavioral health services are limited in the southern rural regions. MST is greatly needed in rural areas and very hard to find. And then we have a comment. Blue Cross has specialized care coordination as well. Unfortunately, children do not get as much benefit from telehealth as they would from in-person services. Telehealth has improved access in rural areas a great deal, however, still limited to the small number of providers. There are lots of behavioral health services here in Taos but there are weights, which I think is bad for people needing this help. Thank you for those comments. We, we have some questions related to telehealth, so I don't know if you want to move to the next question, Martha, and um, we'll sort of continue to take feedback on that issue. Yes, that sounds good. Um, there's another comment in rural areas. Many of my members do not have access to internet and have very poor cellular signals. Additionally, elderly members do not know how to use this technology. Okay, thank you for those. Were the services that you received appropriate to you and your culture?
I'm not seeing uh, comments related to this, uh, so we can keep going. Um, and then, of course, if people have feedback, please just feel free to add it at any point um, related to this question. We have a question. Do we have people in the meeting who would be represented in this question? So, um, yeah, the the we we don't know who's in the meeting. <laughs> it's a public meeting, but uh, we did send our invitation out to all all members, um, and uh, you know included a feedback. Uh, or included an invitation to attend uh, in a customer survey that just went out. So we don't really know. I think we are looking at doing a, a Native American uh, customer session. So we'll be sure to incorporate this question back in to that. And then we have a Spanish language session that's coming up as well uh, next week, I believe. So we'll, we'll be sure to incorporate these questions into those sessions so um, that we can maybe make sure that we're asking the right people those questions. We do have another comment. As was previously said, senior citizens often feel left behind because they aren't tech savvy. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide? We do have another comment. This is difficult to answer. When they do not have someone who speaks Spanish, the translation services, they do not have the ability to look at papers, documents in real time. For the families we serve who are Spanish speaking, we go with them to appointments for support and sometimes interpretation. Thank you for that. The next question, were you able to get help for your issue the first time you asked for help? We have a comment, sending over a comment from a member regarding telemed. She's having trouble connecting, so I'm sending for her. I was grateful to use telemed during COVID in December. I was able to get a procedure due to that visit. Thank you for relaying that information, Christine. It looks like another comment came in from Christine uh, related to this member that she is having trouble connecting um, regarding care coordination and uh, indicating that that's been very helpful to her helping uh, find doctors. Well, that's great to know. Good. Martha, do you want to move to the next question? Yes, ma'am. Thanks. What kinds of barriers did you face when trying to get behavioral health services? We have another comment. Um, during COVID, many providers were working from home, so it made it difficult to contact a real person, not just get voicemail.
lack of providers. Thank you, Melissa. A few of my members had language barriers. They're limited therapists that speak Spanish in my area. Okay, um, thank you. I think um, great feedback, lots of themes here around lack of providers um, and some really interesting feedback around telehealth that maybe we can dig in a little bit more as we go into the telehealth questions. Right there. Yes. Did you receive any behavioral health services through telehealth? If so, would you like to keep getting services that way? And can you tell us why or why not, please? We did get a lot of feedback related to telehealth earlier on. Um, so I wonder if um, that's if folks don't have anything else to add. I'm curious to know if people really like the telehealth model. It sounds like um, it works for some people and not for others. Um, so here comes a comment from Mindy. The feedback I'm getting is that telehealth has really helped with motivation to follow through with services due to not having, oops, excuse me, I have to scroll up, due to not having to face the anxiety of leaving the home and showing up to an appointment in person, avoiding waiting rooms, feeling more intimate in some ways. As a care coordinator, I find that the move to telephonic only coordination during the pandemic has been very successful in terms of efficiency, as we're not spending hours on the road to get to a really remote location where many of our members live. We found that people could get their BH services on the phone, were less likely to last minute cancel, but because it gets reimbursed at a lower rate, they don't want to continue it. That's great feedback. Thank you. Thanks for those comments. Do you want to move on to the next question, Martha? Yes, please. Do you have any additional feedback? 
Thank you, Martha. Yeah. So this is really our last question. Yeah. Uh, and this is just the catch all for anything that uh, folks may want to add that we didn't talk about today related to either Medicaid or behavioral health. Uh, if there's anything that you feel we could be doing better. Um, so it looks like there's another comment that came in uh, to Chris. Well, one comment related to behavioral, uh, the, the reimbursement rate um, that Presbyterian pays the same amount for an in person visit as it does for telehealth. And then a comment from Christine um, stating that her member says that telehealth can also work when a doctor is unable to see a person in the office from COVID or time schedule. Also when there's transportation, especially in rural areas. Um, and I think that's, that's very uh, true. We have uh, expanded telehealth, not only in the behavioral health arena, but also across the delivery system for primary care and many people have been able to have their needs met um, through a telehealth visit. Any other feedback? Another comment um, seeing that would be great to offer gym memberships to get in better shape and also add adult dental. So some feedback there about some value added services. Um, and then a suggestion that we develop an app for members with reminders to renew their application and remind them to refill prescriptions take prescriptions um, and message providers, people like apps, and we'll use them if they have access to them and have some tech knowledge. So that's good feedback as well. We are working on an app for our Yes New Mexico online application portal. Um, so that is one thing that we're doing. And I think probably the MCOs may do some of those reminders, but um, that's good feedback. And uh, one of the ways that we're that's really into goal, that second goal or third goal, I think, around um, use of technology to make access easier. Any other comments or suggestions before we wrap up the listening portion of the agenda today? Okay. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for joining to give feedback. We have a few more slides, if you can just bear with us for a few minutes um, as we wrap this up. We did, um, send out a survey i believe it went out on friday uh last week might have been thursday but we sent out a survey to our customers um and we are asking for feedback around our delivery model um, how people access services so for those of you who work with customers if you could please encourage them to respond to the survey or for those of you who are customers of hsd we would love to hear from you and get feedback we're also accepting feedback through email. So if you have something that you weren't able to talk about today or didn't feel comfortable raising in this forum, please feel free to email us and we will um, be able to accept that feedback as part of this listening cycle. Um, we are also, or you can also send us mail about it and we will take feedback that way. Um, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we're, this is really the kickoff for what is a week of listening sessions um, that will kind of go into the next couple of weeks, actually. Um, today is the first session related to Medicaid and behavioral health. Um, tomorrow afternoon, we'll be doing a session related to our child support services that we offer through the Human Services Department. 
And then on Wednesday um, this week, we'll be doing a session related specifically to applying for services and accessing customer services um, through our HSD call center and other means that the department serves uh, customers. Uh, we'll have so a set of questions related to those issues. And then on Tuesday, June 1st, we'll be doing a specific session on um, the same topic, but in Spanish. And then we are getting ready to schedule another session uh, specifically for our Native American customers um, as well. Next slide, please. Um, so a big thank you to you all for participating and joining us here today. We know that you're very busy um, and we really appreciate the feedback. Uh, and we actually are taking a log of all of the feedback that's received. We're going to put it in a report uh, for the HSD leadership um, and we'll be sort of using that feedback to develop specific strategic goals um, that HSD can um, implement over the next year and work on. So we really appreciate your taking the time to talk to us. Um, we know it's a little awkward in this virtual format, but just um, thank you for doing that and for showing up to give us feedback today. And with that, I think we can conclude. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.